please remain standing as we honor God's word this morning. I just want to read a couple of verses from the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. Today we are talking about the law of God and Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for you. God, we are here today to worship you, to honor you, to glorify you. And God, I pray that you would be the center of our attention. God, as we look at your word, may, may we study your word. May we talk about you knowing that you are the King of Kings, the God who is crowned above all, and the one who has come to fulfill the law. God, may you fulfill our lives. May you, may you fulfill our destinies today. God, we praise you for who you are today. Please speak to each and every one of us through your word. In your holy name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, guys. How's everyone? Good. So this morning we are finishing our two-week series called The Fallen Kingdom. And my sermon title is The New Laws of the Land. Today we are talking about the the law of God. Last week we talked about what Paul said, for I'm no longer under the law but under grace. We are no longer under the law but under grace. And today I want to talk about how Christ has has fulfilled the law. But but in order to do that, the first thing, before we get into God's Word, I want to, before we know the laws of God, we have to be able to put the laws of God in our hearts. And the only way really we can do that is through His Word. So that's why I want to encourage you that today, next Sunday, we are starting a series 10 weeks long. We're going to go through the book of Philippians and 1 Peter. I encourage you to be a part of that. But also our life groups are going to study, study the same thing. Our um, Sunday morning class is going to go through the same books. Our youth are going to study the same thing. And it's all going to be church-wide, but all from different perspectives. So I encourage you to join a life group, join the Sunday morning class. And I just want to encourage you to be part of something along other people, alongside of other people while doing the same thing along with you, okay? If you say, well, I can't do either one of those, well, I'm starting my men's group back up on Monday night at 6.30 on the 22nd, not tomorrow, but the next Monday. Rick is starting his, uh, Rick Foddy right there, raise your hand, Rick, would you? He's starting his men's group at 6.45 on Wednesday mornings. Just join something. Our women are starting their studies with Beth Moore. Just join and find a way to study God's Word and put the laws of God in your heart, okay? Because you can do it much better with other people than on your own. But today, we're going to talk about how Christ has come to fulfill the law and how He has fulfilled it for us. So if you have your Bibles, would you open up to the book of Exodus? In order for us to see the laws of God, I want us to look at the old law, which is the law of Moses. Everybody know the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments and all that. I want us to take a look at that, look at, and then, and then turn to the, the new law of Jesus or the fulfilled law of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, please open up to Exodus chapter 31. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand so that our ushers bring you one. Open, take out your phones if you want to. Just don't play games, okay? And I want to read just one verse from 31, and then we we'll go to chapter 32. Verse 18 says, When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on the Mount Sinai, He gave him the two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Okay, so in case you don't know the story, this kind of sets us up with, what, with, with where we want to go with this story. In case you don't know it or you don't remember it, you just need to have your memory refreshed. At this point, the Israelites had been slaves for 400 years in Egypt. At this point, they have come out of Egypt. Moses has led them out. They have seen God's miracles upon miracles. They have seen the, Nile, the river Nile turn into blood. They have seen frogs get over the land. They have seen the gnats. They have seen boils and all sorts of different things. They have seen the spirit of death, angel of death come and, 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 and kill the firstborns of the Egyptians, except everybody who had the, lamb, uh, the, the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And they have seen all these things. But on top of that, they have seen that God has part the sea at the command of Moses God has parted the sea and they have were able to pass through it and to escape the Egyptians and the Egyptian army has been demolished in the water they have seen all of that and now they are in the wilderness and it's the time for them to wait on the power of God okay so today I want to tell you this we're talking about the law of God okay and every time we talk about laws people are like this is boring it's not exciting. Talking about laws is not fun. But if I told you we're going to talk about breaking the laws, you would be all excited, right? 
But when we're going to talk about the laws of God in the beginning of it. It might not be interesting, but it gets exciting because we will see that Christ has fulfilled the law of God. Okay? It gets exciting. So, so at this point, the Israelites are in the wilderness, and they are waiting to hear from God to when and how they're going to get to the promised land. And meanwhile, God calls Moses to the top of the mountain to give him the laws that he wants the people to practice. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So now... The people are waiting, and chapter 32, verse 1 says, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. These people have just seen God do amazing miracles and different things, but now that Moses is gone for a few days, they cannot wait on God. And here's, this is in your notes if you want to write it down. Uh, it, will, might, it, might, it may not make sense yet, but it will hopefully at the, towards the end. Fulfilled laws of God can only be anticipated with patience. Fulfilled laws of God can only be anticipated with patience. And what I mean with that is, um, it's just like this. I, I remember when I was eight years old or so, uh, my dad, we were living in Tehran, the capital of Iran at the time. My dad um, got a job to do some construction work in a southern part of Iran in, a, in an island called Qesh. Um, and, and he would go every other week or so. He would come back. On one occasion, he came back, uh, came back home and he said, Hey, Nasser, why don't you go with me this time? And I was like all excited. I, I, my mom wasn't too happy about it, so I begged my mom to go. It was my first time going, um, flying with an airplane on an airplane. So I got on a plane. I was all excited. We landed in a city on the southern part of Iran. I'm not going to tell you its name because you won't remember it anyways. It's hard Persian name. Um, we landed in this city. And I remember after landing, it, 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 we, after landing we, had to catch, we had to catch a boat to cross to the island. It was the only way to get to the island. And we, I remember I was a kid. I was excited about everything. Everything was interesting. I was enthusiastic about everything. And I'm, I remember uh, we got into this boat. Now, anybody who has seen like Middle Eastern pictures or videos or things like that, you know that the Middle Eastern people are known for filling up a car until they can't fit anybody else in it. Or a motorcycle can have 20 people on it, okay? Well, we got in this. I'm not making this up. We got into this little boat. It's a tiny boat. And this boat was cram-packed with people that I could see the boat just going lower and lower as people are getting in it, okay? So 20 people were so in this tiny boat, and I didn't care. I wasn't scared because I was with my dad, and I didn't care about the world at that po point as much, except the fact that I was enjoying myself. And we, the guy started the engine of the boat, zzz, you know, 20 minutes into the ride, we get to a scenery that I was really fascinated by. A sunken ship, huge ship that that his head was sticking out of the water, and I was so fascinated by it. I was like, like a kid wiggling around. Everybody was sitting there because, you know, this, the boat is almost sinking. Everybody's sitting right there, and I'm like wiggling around. I'm like, Dad, what is this ship? Tell me about it. And my dad tells me that this was a boat that used to carry paper. Uh, it, his cargo was paper, taking it all over, and, and on some occasion, it got on, caught on fire, and it sunk right here. And then I'm, I look around. I stop looking, and I'm like, what is wrong with these people in the boat? Why are they all sitting like this, scared? Their eyes are like so big. What's going on with these people? And my, I'm like, Dad, what's going on? And I'm wiggling around. My dad says, look in the water. And I look, and there is hundreds of fins of brown sharks <laughs> all over this boat and around our boat. And I looked at it. I, I was like, okay, that's why the people don't want me to rock the boat as much. <laughs> but, but I tell you, what, what is the point of this? I tell you this because when we are anticipating God's laws to be fulfilled. It is just like us being on a boat like that. See, for people, it doesn't make sense. For the people of Israel, it doesn't make sense. When you are a kid, it doesn't make sense. When you are immature in your faith, it doesn't make sense. But you are on a boat, and the more you rock it, the more you endanger yourself and everybody else's lives of being eaten alive. But people who wait for the fulfillment of God's laws, wait patiently, anticipate patiently to get to the their destination so they sit sometimes quietly waiting on God because they know that if they rock the boat they will be eaten by the sharks patience sometimes is something that we don't have when it comes to God but watch watch what happens okay verse 2 says Aaron answered them you would you would think that Aaron being the spiritual leader after Moses he would say no 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 we can't make gods we just have seen God part the sea 
But Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took them, um, he took them, and, hand, um, hold on, sorry. He took them off, took the earrings off, and brought them to Aaron. He took them, took them what they had handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf, announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord, meaning the calf. There will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards they sat down to eat, drink, and drink, and got up to indulge in reverie. And you may read this, okay, because you know this story. You may read this, or you know part of this story, I should say. And you say, these people are stupid. I mean, you're going to, if you're going to make an idol, why would you make a cow? Oh, be, be, be creative, right? I mean, if you're going to make a god that to worship, why would you make a cow? Or why would you even make an idol? You have just seen God do amazing things. And, and you are just have to, right now you have to wait for God to fulfill his loss for you. Why, why, why would you make an idol of a shape of a cow? But here's the thing. Go to the previous picture for me, would you? It's, this is called the, you see, you have to understand the Egyptian, cult, Egyptian culture, okay? In the Egyptian culture, there were two gods made in the shape of a cow. The first one was called the god Malak. Malak was, see, this is personal opinion. I, this is, I can't back this up, but personal opinion is that I don't think the Egyptians made an idol in the shape of Malak because Malak was an evil god. He required human sacrifice. And the bottom chambers where they would put their babies in to burn them because they wanted to sacrifice it to Malak. Okay, that was one of the Egyptian gods. The next one, go to the next one for me. The next one is called Apis. Now, Apis, in, in, in Egyptian mythology, Apis was a god depicted as a bull symbolizing fertility and his strength at war. He was also closely linked to Pharaoh. It was believed that Apis and Pharaoh were both ordained to save the land. People also believed that Apis was, was the god that was the mediator between man and all the other gods, and they would often pray to him when they were in need of fixing their desolate land. Now you tell me, wouldn't it make sense that when you are in a desolate land in the wilderness and you're waiting for God to tell you what to do, and God doesn't do what you want Him to do, wouldn't it make sense for you to do something that you have learned throughout many years? For 400 years, they were slaves in Egypt. For 400 years, they learned the culture, the patterns, the lifestyle of the Egyptians. And of course it makes sense. When God doesn't seem to show up when you need Him to show up, of course it makes sense that you would run to what you already know. You're good at that. You're natural at that. That's why a drug addict is immediately prone to run to, uh, to drugs when, when, he, when things go south for him. That's why an alcoholic runs to alcohol immediately when things don't work out for him. That's why you go to the gods that you know before you can wait on God to deliver you. But here's the thing. Fulfilled laws of God do not contain the old, but only the new. And this may still not make sense for you guys yet, but... What to simplify this a little bit, and hopefully we'll cover this more, to simplify this a little bit, is when you give your life to Christ, prior to that, you may live a sinful life. But after giving your life to Christ, Christ transforms you to a new person, so you cannot come back two years later and be still in the same patterns of life, because the old should have been vanished. So the new laws of God do not contain the old, but contain the new but at this point, so, so Moses, Moses is still on the mountain. The people have built an, built an uh, idol that they are worshiping. Verse 7 says, then, then the Lord said to Moses, Go down because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. And then God says, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now, how, and now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. God is so angry with what they have done that says, let me kill them all, send them to where they really deserve to go, which is hell. 
and I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. But here, listen, this is so important. What Moses says or what Moses does is so powerful and may not have to do with what really we are talking about, the laws of God. But Moses says, verse 11, I just want to read the first part of it, then you guys read it later on for yourself. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. And then he goes on to say, from there to verse 14, says that Moses pleaded with God about them. God said, let me kill them all. Moses said, no, please, God, don't kill them all. Please, just show your mercy through to them. Show your glory through them. God, please don't kill them all. Let me ask you this. How often do you plead for people? You know, people often come to me and say, now, sir, would you go talk to so-and-so? He needs Jesus. People come to me and say, hey, now, sir, would you pray for my family member? He, he, they, they, they are doing bad things in their lives. But how often do you plead with God? See, Moses is pleading. Pleading is different than just praying for somebody. Moses is begging God, God, do not let your wrath be upon these people. Do not let them face your anger. How often do you do that for the people in your life who need to experience the love of Christ? And if you don't plead for them, who will? See, this may not have to do with the fulfilled law of God, but it will, it will have to do with the fulfilled law of God for their lives. So Moses pleads with the Lord. Moses pleads with them and God's anger subsides and, and God says, okay, I won't kill them all. I won't wipe them all out. So Moses, but you go down and Moses goes down, verse 15. Guys, later on, read this for yourselves, okay? Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands. We don't know whether they were Android, iPads, Windows tablets. We have no idea what kind of tablets he was carrying with him. Okay, the two tablets of the covenant in his hands. This is important detail. Remember, we have already looked at it, but important detail. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. In other words, God himself had spoken the laws. He himself had written the laws with his own finger, as we read in Matthew, in, in um, Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, God himself with his own hand had written these laws and handed them to Moses and said, now take these laws and give them to the people. Let them practice. So Joshua is a little bit below. Moses goes down the mountain. Verse 17 says, when Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, there's a sound of war in the camp. The sound of war. And this is so powerful. You may read this verse and say, no, there's, this, is not, there's, this, is not, this is not powerful at all. Okay, but this is, this is my perspective on it. Listen, this is so powerful. Moses replied, it is not the sound of victory. It is not the sound of defeat. It is the sound of singing that I hear. It is not the sound of victory because if it was victory, the, the, the sound would be different. It is not the sound of defeat because if it was defeat, there would be mourning. But what you are hearing is the thing that is in between victory and in between defeat, which is one word, chaos. Chaos. Every time... You, before you, you proclaim victory, before you have victory, before you have defeat, there's always chaos in between it. Always chaos in between it. And right now, because the Israelites could not be patient on God, they are going through chaos in their lives. Fulfilled laws of God eliminate chaos. And you may say, well, Nasser, how do you say that? I have been a follower of Jesus for a long time, and in my life there is still chaos. Now listen, if you have been a follower of Jesus, you may experience chaos, you may be in chaos, but there is one thing that is guaranteed, that Christ will eliminate chaos by giving you this peace that surpasses all understanding. The peace of Christ will fill your hearts, and the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding will be with you because the spirit of peace will be on you. And if you are people who constantly live in chaos, could it be that you are not in the fulfilled law of God? Now, I want to read one more verse from this chapter later on. Please go home, read it to yourselves, because we won't have time to cover everything. But verse 19 says, When Moses approached the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing. His anger burns, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. And this doesn't have anything to do with what I'm talking about, but how many of you have anger issues and you throw things at people? Be honest, it's okay. Moses was just like you. In fact, remember the two tablets that he just threw down and broke? Remember the two, those two tablets were the handwriting of God? 
that God had just written the laws of God down and had given, hey Moses, why don't you take these laws of, of that I am giving you and take it to the people and Moses breaks those laws because he's so angry. And, and what you may not have realized, and even Moses may not have realized that when Moses broke those two tablets, that indication should have hit all of us that man is incapable of not breaking the law. God can give it to you in his own handwriting. God can give it to you in, in, with his own breath. God can give it to you, write it to you, give it to you nicely, give it to you angrily. It doesn't matter how he gives it to you. You cannot not break the law. You are people, individuals who break the law. Anybody here has never broken the Ten Commandments before? Raise your hand. Anybody? No? No hands? Because we are incapable of not breaking the law. So God deals with the situation. God's grace actually covers them and deals with the situation. It goes on. I just want to read a couple more verses. Go to chapter 34. A bunch of them have to pay for what they have done, but God's anger subsides. God forgives them. God gives them another chance because God is good at giving us another chance. God gives them another chance. Verse 27, 28 in chapter 34 says, When God's anger was subsided and all that, when the, then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a, new co I have made a covenant with you and Israel. Moses was there with the Lord. For 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water, and he wrote, the, he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So at this point, God said, you know, I wrote the laws and gave them to you. You broke them. Your people broke them. How about you just come and write these laws now so you may remember them this time? So Moses writes the laws. He writes them this time himself. He carves them, and at this point, probably they're getting carved in his heart, and he, he writes them down. But listen, from then on, here comes the indication that we, we may have missed. Man can write the laws. He will break them again, and he will rewrite them again, and he will break them again. He will write and break and write, and then people got so much good at writing their own laws that forgot about writing the laws of God that Pharisees wrote over 5,000 laws that they added to the laws of Moses. And then he couldn't even breathe without breaking the law. And for generations after generations, people broke the law. And then God said, I'm done with this. He said, I'm done with this breaking of the law. You know how God wrote the laws with his own finger and gave them to Moses? Scripture says that, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, the Word was with God, and the Word took the form of a man and came down. And it says that, that the Word, which is the laws of God, walked amongst men. He walks amongst men. And, and we started with Matthew chapter 5 saying, Jesus said, I have not come to demolish the law, but to, to fulfill it. And in Matthew chapter 6 and 7 tells us about the laws that Jesus spoke with his own mouth. He said, he said that if you hate your brother, you have murdered them. He said that if you look at a woman with adulterous eyes, you have already committed adultery. And Jesus spoke the laws of God because he was the laws of God. And man broke the laws by breaking the body of Jesus because man is incapable of not breaking the law because you cannot not break the law but God had a plan he knew that you cannot not break the law he knew that you're incapable so he said that the only way that the law cannot be broken is if it is fulfilled. And the only way that it cannot be broken is if the powers of the law of sin and death are demolished. So as he breathed his last breath on the cross, as his body was broken, he battled the forces of Satan, he battled the forces of hell as he died. And he overcame and demolished the forces of death and sin when he resurrected. And he fulfilled the law by making it in such a way that cannot ever be broken. In other words, when you broke the law, he gave you a way so you wouldn't have to. See, as much as the law can be broken, as much as the law can be broken, as much as you can break the law over and over again, grace can never be broken. Grace can never be shaken. Grace has the power to demolish the powers of sin and death. Grace has the power of God. 
Grace has the power to forgive the wrong. Grace has the power to, to reconcile man and God. Grace is the name of God Himself. Grace is the divine love of God Himself. Grace is the shadow of the God Almighty that covers you when you are in wrong. Grace is the wings of an eagle that allows you to soar under the shadow of the God Almighty. Grace is the name of Jesus Christ that as much as you can, you can, you can fight sin, you can uh, battle sin, you can try, but grace has already covered you if you have believed in the name of Jesus Christ. And the power of grace has already fulfilled this, the law of God and the power of grace has already demolished the powers of sin and death that no longer the law of sin and death exists because grace is much more powerful than law. And Christ died on the cross so that you can receive grace so you would have no need to break the law. Now don't misunderstand me here. I am not saying that because you are under grace that you are not going to make mistakes and sin. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that fulfilled laws of God begin and end with Christ through grace. Fulfilled laws of God begin and end with Christ through grace. But it doesn't mean that, that you can keep on, keep on breaking the law. See, if you're under grace, as I said earlier, if you're under grace, prior to you coming to grace, you could have lived an adulterous life. But now that you are in Christ, if some time has gone by and you have no change in your life, since you gave yourself to Christ, could it be that you are not in the fulfilled law of Christ? Again, I'm also not saying that you're not going to sin. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to do wrongs. But the mistakes that you make are not the mistakes that you made intentionally because you were in sin and death. The mistakes that you make are going to be the mistakes that you make because you are trying to transform in the image of God. And because you're human, you cannot be like God and you will fall short constantly. So today, where are you? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Where are you? You know, we read last week from Romans chapter 6 where, where Paul said, we are, no longer, we are no longer under the law but under grace. Are you under grace? Because if you're under grace, God should be transforming you into a different person. See, the old law is gone. The old stuff is gone. You will not be able to bring the old stuff in. But now you have the new law of God, which is the covenant of grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. That will forgive your sins for an eternity with God. Where are you with God today? That's the question. Are you under His grace or are you still in the law of sin and death? Are you still practicing the rituals? Are you still, when you are lost and you don't know which path to take, are you still running to the idols? Are you still running to what you know because they sound good? Because, because for 400 years you practiced those laws and rules and regulations so you know that I can run to the God Apis and he would, he's called to be the, the, the guy who fixes the desolate land. Is that what you're running to? Or are you waiting on that boat and rocking it because you don't really know where to go? Or are you waiting patiently for the laws of God to be fulfilled in your life? So examine your heart today. Would you stand up with me? You know, I, I, I have talked for half an hour and I said all these things where Apostle Paul said them a hundred times better than I could in a few words. In Romans chapter 7, verses 4 to 8. Paul says this, says, my brothers and sisters, let these words sink in your heart, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. You are no longer under the law, but you are under grace, and you have died like he has died, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions arose by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. I love, I love these words. Everybody say, but now, would you? But now. I've said this before. I love these words. But now. Say it one more time. But now. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. In other words, at some point in my life, I was under the law, but now because of the grace of Jesus Christ, see, the law that was inscribed by the finger of God, 
the law that walked amongst men in flesh now lives in me if I believe in Jesus Christ because the Spirit of the Almighty who is the lawgiver lives inside of me. The new law of God resides in me and you if you believe in Jesus Christ. And when there is the Spirit of Jesus Christ, there is your freedom from the old law, whether it was the law of sin or any other laws. So prayer team members, would you surround the room? At this point, if any of you are going through a hard time, would you come pray with our prayer team members? Come up, I'll be up here, pray with me. If you are doubting God, if you're wondering if God is really for you, if you're wondering if, if grace is something that you have experienced or you have not experienced, come pray with one of us. If the Spirit of God leads you to kneel before Him, come up here and kneel, come kneel wherever you want to kneel. Just kneel before God and pray. If the Spirit of God asks you to raise your hands and just worship Him and admire Him, just do so. Don't be afraid because this moment is not for me. This moment is not for you. This is a moment where you glorify the name of the King of Kings. Okay, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I praise you. We praise you here together as your church, as your people. God, I thank you that I, I can speak for myself. God, I know how wretched I have been. I know how wretched I can be. God, I know that there is no day that goes by that I don't go breaking laws. But I praise you that the law of grace is so much powerful. God, I praise you that you are the fulfillment of the law of God. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have given each one of us who believe in the name of the God Almighty, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior of all, you have given us your spirit today. The spirit of God that is with us gives us the, the path of God, leads us, shows us the path of God and allows us to walk with God. Lord Jesus, we worship you for what you have done for us. God, thank you that when we are impatient, you still have grace upon us. God, thank you that when we try to drag the oldest stuff that we knew, you still have patience with us and your grace still covers us. Lord, I pray that no individual would re leave this place without asking you to go with them. God, I pray that no individual would, would take off without knowing the, or being touched by the Spirit of God today. Lord Jesus, we love you. We worship you. And thank you for, for our church. Thank you that we can be here together worshiping you, Lord. In your holy name I pray. Amen.